It was a beautiful sunny day, and I remember waking up that morning, and the sun was beaming through the window in our house. I was in Somalia at this point. Um, waking up that morning, something was a little bit strange. All of a sudden, I came out to our terrace. I noticed my mum's usual caterer is in the house. And I thought, oh, okay, it's not my birthday, so why do we have a caterer today? And dad is out of town, so mum is not going to host any of his friends. And I thought, that's very strange. They were putting up decorations, they were cooking some food, my aunties were around, all the neighbors came down. But I remember even noticing the whole house were only full of women, funnily enough. And I thought, okay, that's very strange. I remember walking around, and then my neighbor's daughter came up to me, and she said, oh, today's your special day. And I said, oh, special day. And by the way, bear in mind, we only came back to Somalia a few weeks before this. I grew up between Italy and Saudi Arabia as a child. Very professional uh, parents, grandparents were doctors. So this is us settling back in Somalia again. And all of a sudden, my neighbor's daughter, who must have been around eight, nine at this point, said to me, today is your good neen day. And I said, what is good neen? She goes, no, you're going to have your good neen today. She's explaining something to me. And while she's explaining this to me, I hear this horrible scream across from, the, from our house. It was my sister screaming. She was screaming for my mother. She was screaming for me. And before I realized something horrible was happening, all I heard them say was, get Layla, get Layla, it's Layla's turn. I didn't know what I was running away from, but I ran as fast as I could. But I'm only seven years old. They caught me. I was brought into this room. I was pinned to a table by women who I trusted, family friends who I knew. Within minutes, my legs were spread apart, and before I knew it, a sharp knife was taken to my genitals. I was cut, and I was told to behave myself if I wanted this to be over as quickly as possible. I was also stitched. I had two stitches to my genitals. Ladies and gents, at the age of seven, I've endured a practice called female genital mutilation. Female genital mutilation, it's partially or totally removal of the female genitalia. And I'm sure many of you here are thinking, what the hell? Why would that even happen to you as a child? FGM happens for many, many reasons. People would say it's their culture, it's their religion, it's their identity. I was cut, fundamentally, I was cut. Number one, I was a girl. I needed to be controlled. And one thing they needed to control was my sexuality. The idea that a woman is sexually free, it's not acceptable. And that's just not with my community, that's a global issue. Women all over the world are being controlled and their sexuality is constantly being controlled. FGM is one of the worst forms of violence against women and girls. How does it affect women? It affects them physically, emotionally, psychologically. Women who've undergone one of the worst forms of FGM where they cut the large labias, small labias, and the clitoris, and it's actually closed to a point where they're left with a very small opening. They're expected to urinate, menstruate, have intercourse and give birth at some point. They can't urinate. They take 10, 20 to 30 minutes to urinate. You can only imagine what it's like to give birth. A lot of these women have died during birth. A lot of children, while undergoing this horrible practice, have had heart attacks and died of hemorrhaging. I'm actually very lucky to be standing here today because I should have died that day of what happened to me. Over 200 million women globally are living with FGM. FGM happens from women in Russia to Malaysia, Indonesia, to women in Colombia, over, over 28 African countries, and the Middle East. FGM is a big global issue. Three million alone are at risk in the African continent every single year. Half a million women 
in Europe and now live with FGM. Where I'm from in the UK, 137,000 are on record. This is not a small number. Every 11 seconds, a girl will be cut. So by the time I come off this stage, how many would have been cut by then? And remember what I said, these are children who did not consent to this. I started campaigning against FGM, not because I thought it was wrong, I wanted to protect my daughter, but how did I get to that point? I was a girl who grew up in the West, I thought FGM was actually okay. It was only when a health professional who had the right training asked me the question, oh, Ms. Hussein, can I just check if you've undergone this practice? Oh, guess what my response was? Oh, no, 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 I'm fine. I didn't have the worst type. I'd had type one, type two, not the severe one. I didn't have a problem having sex or urinating or having a menstrual cycle. She goes, what was your pregnancy really like? And I said, oh, no. I said, I was very depressed. And any time anyone vaginally examined me, I passed out. And when I said I passed out, I passed out. I got used to every time I had a smear test, someone waking me up. That became my life. She was the first person to say to me, Ms. Hussein, what you've been experiencing is flashback because the person who cut me was actually a medical doctor. So you can imagine every time a medical doctor came towards me with an instrument between my legs, my body went back to that moment. So by having that safe dialogue with this health profession, her name is Jennifer Bourne, it meant I can now protect my daughter from this practice. My daughter's only three months at the time. Her name is Firuz. But that wasn't enough. I said to myself, if I had such information in my school, I wonder what would have happened. Could I have asked for help? How come my medical, uh, my family doctor didn't say anything? How come my midwife didn't say anything to me? So that anger was fueled inside of me. I come from a family of activists. Shocking me enough, because FGM is something that was just normal in our family. But I was also brought up with asking questions, so I started asking that question. Why, why, why are girls all over the world undergoing this vile practice? From that moment, I realized this was not a cultural or religious practice. This is how it was packaged to all of us. FGM is one of the worst forms of child abuse is a form of sexual assault against children. And like I said, this is not something children consented to. Unfortunately, there wasn't enough investment in this field. Because it was packaged in such a way, no one wants to invest in this. But because of campaigners like myself and other fellow campaigners, one of the things that we've done in the UK, we challenged the UK government. Do you want to know how I challenged the UK government? Please feel free to laugh. So basically, what I'd done, I baked vagina cupcakes <laughs> and gave it out in the middle of the streets. And then I went with a six-foot guy, and I wanted him to wear a six-foot vagina and chase our previous Home Secretary, Theresa May. <laughs> she's, now, she's now our Prime Minister, so I didn't get any invites recently, and I'm wondering why that happened. <laughs> But, yeah, by the way, I like to use humor when I'm doing this work. It's the only way I can cope. So for me, having political will and challenging politicians was very key. Working with communities wasn't enough. So the UK government are actually the only, U are only, are the only government that's actually given more money than any other government in the world. So the UK government gave us 10 million, um, 8 million. And so if you divide the 200 million women who have undergone this practice, it means only four cents for each girl. What does that say about politicians? And unfortunately, again, globally, women and girls are always on the back burner when it comes to decision making and when it comes to investing. Going back to Jennifer Bourne, the woman who spoke to me, she created a safe space for me. The Dahlia Project was born out of that safe space. Dahlia Project was something that I was very passionate about when I was training as a psychotherapist. Because every time I saw a therapist, I had to tell them what FGM actually was. I didn't want the women to do that anymore. I wanted them to walk in, 
and tell their stories, and for them to recognize what they've undergone is actually abuse. That is what I want the women to know. But please know, this is no easy job. A woman, a black woman, with a Muslim name, Leila Hussein, is quite recognizable. Sometimes it's not a good thing. It's standing on stage, and she's talking about sexuality, religion, race, and gender. You're not very popular around people most of the time. And because of that, there's a lot of obstacles that comes with this role. I was attacked, I was physically attacked. I remember actually going to, I went to one of my exams with a fat lip because somebody punched me in the face. Sadly, I had to move home a couple of times. My daughter and I had to go into a refuge a few times. And I currently have a panic alarm in my house. My address is protected, and I have to let everybody know where I am at all times. It's not an easy life, but it's something that we have to do in order to make sure our daughters are safe. And for me, it was always protecting my daughter from harm. And it wasn't just FGM I wanted to protect her from. It was all forms of um, oppression that I needed to protect her from. Unfortunately, we still have systems in place that has no respect for women and girls. And I constantly, I'm sorry if you heard me say this before, but I always rant about this as an example. In the UK, the US, many parts in the world, women are being taxed for having periods, basically. Tampon taxing. I absolutely hate that particular law. How am I supposed to fight against FGM? When I'm bleeding, my government's making money out of me. I actually came up with a really great solution, but if you want to follow, this is up to you. I suggested that we should all, all the women in this room, we should all not wear um, tampons anymore and just bleed everywhere <laughs> as a protest. <laughs> can, you, can you just picture me with my work clothes and just bleeding everywhere? <laughs> and you know what? They're not going to take the tax away. They're going to give it to us for free if we do that. So for me, the reason I use that example, I cannot trust a government who has no respect for my body to take FGM seriously. So when I'm tackling FGM, I have to tackle all forms of oppression against human beings. I always say human rights is not like a, a Pizza Hut buffet where you pick what you choose. You are the for it or against it. You are the for it or against it. But I don't do this work by myself. One thing I believe in, sisterhood actually got me through a lot of shit. I'm not even kidding. Sorry. They can bleep me out if they have to. <laughs> I don't stand here on my own. A lot of women fight with me. Some of them are in this room as we speak. Some of them are not here at the moment. And some of them have actually passed away because of FGM. But let me introduce you to some of my squad, I like to call them. Listen, if Taylor Swift is allowed to have a squad, I think I should have one too, okay? <laughs> and I would like to thank Oslo Freedom Forum for always making me feel I'm a bit of a Taylor Swift when I'm around. <laughs> so yeah, especially with all the crying. <laughs> Because, you know, with all the crying, you know, we need to invest in some really, a lot of concealers backstage. Um, so Isa, Isa on this side, it's uh, all these women, by the way, are FGM survivors. So Isa is a midwife, specialist midwife in the UK, well known for her work. She actually currently is setting up uh, midwifery hospitals in um, Congo. And so we have these amazing women. And these pictures are from a project that I um, co-created with an amazing photographer, Jason Ashwood. What we wanted to do was actually use positive images of FGM survivors, because the media constantly portrays us as, as these broken, non-sexual, sad women. Obviously, that's not the case. <laughs> Listen, I always say, I'm the very good example why FGM actually never bloody worked. <laughs> I was supposed to be silent, not be confident, not be sexual. I always say, bring Idris Elba in this room and we'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll see what happens. 
By the way, I like to always mention Idris Elbi in my talks, just hoping he will contact me. So please, when you tweet me, tag him as well. Thanks. <laughs> so Hoda, who's in the middle. Hoda's a sexual health nurse, a long-time campaigner, but Hoda was also one of the women who came to my first support groups. Um, and, and the reason these women gave me, the, they gave me the permission to tell some of their stories. Hoda, um, unfortunately, because of FGM, has, has been actually, she had a gynecologist from the age of nine. Imagine having a gynecologist from the age of nine. Unfortunately, she couldn't have children. The, her right to be a mother was taken away because of this. She's still in care. She's still somebody who has to go in and out of hospital on a weekly basis. But when you meet her, she's one of the most amazing women you'll ever meet, one of the strongest people I know. And I get to call her one of my best friends, which is great. Um, Sarian. Sarian, it's another campaigner from Sierra Leone. She protected four of her daughters from this. You protect one girl from this, you save many, many generations from FGM and all forms of violence against women and girls. How is say? How is say? She's one of our long term, uh, she's been campaigning against FGM for over 30 years now, but she's the silent ones. I call them the backstage troublemakers. <laughs> there are us at the front, they're the backstage. Hawa has protected her daughter from this 25 years ago. And let me tell you, 25 years ago, this was not an easy thing to talk about. Hiba on this side, Hiba is one of my colleagues from the UK. Again, another very vocal campaigner, protected her daughters from this practice. For me, what I really wanted to show in these images, face of defiance, was there is a way out of this and we can still protect our daughters. The next picture is quite difficult. It's my sister in the middle. Um, she's the one that was, that was screaming that day. Um, sorry, I always get very emotional when I talk about this one. Um, so, <clears throat> I, I carried this guilt for many years. Even though I was seven, I, I carried this guilt that I couldn't protect her that day. Actually, if she was here today, she would tell you, Layla thinks she's my mother and she needs to protect me from everything. I think I still carry that and that's, that's not fair on me. My sister has two sons. I can happily say to you, we are raising two amazing feminist boys in our household. <laughs> FGM, fundamentally, is done for men. That's not a myth, that's the truth. It's important that we work with men. Men need to be part of this war with us. You need to stand up and speak out. You are a father, you are a brother, you are our allies, you need to speak out. Use your bloody privilege as a man to speak out against this. And I'll tell you a quick story that recently happened. I went to Senegal to take more of these pictures and I met amazing fathers who stepped up to protect their daughters. And I said to one of them, oh, you know, me being the Western girl from the diaspora, what obstacles have you faced, you know, to protect your daughter from this? And he goes, none. He said, I'm a man, I have that privilege. And because he stopped his daughters from undergoing this, his whole village stopped practicing FGM. So men, you play a great role, hence why my nephews, Ahmed and Jabril, are absolutely important to this work. Let me be honest, and mothers in this audience who have sons, please raise your sons well, because then I could have avoided dating some really assholes, okay? <laughs> could have avoided it. <laughs> I'm sure there are good ones out there, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm not going to lose hope. <laughs> so why is it important to invest in girls? This. This is my child. <laughs> this is Feruz, who wasn't cut. Feruz, this is a picture actually from the Women's March. Thank you, America. She was actually very sick that day, and I said, you know, you can stay at home. She goes, no, 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 no. She goes, Mom, we need to go out and we need to fight. And she said, you know, she's going to design her own poster. So imagine me coming from a very conservative family where we weren't allowed to talk about vaginas, and a Beyonce fan, obviously. So, I think, we, I think it's not just any movement now, it's the pussy's information. It's the new hashtag. <laughs> so I would like to urge you all, 
I would like to end with this actually picture. Did you see the earlier picture was me and my mother? And now, this is me holding on to my daughter. One thing we have in common, me and my mother, we were both women who loved their children. My mother was also a victim of this. She felt by loving me, she had to do this for me in order to be accepted. I raised my daughter to be unique, different, with an intact vagina, of course. And that's okay, you don't have to fit in. Currently, we have the Girl Generation program, which is one of the biggest global movements in the world. So I would like to urge you all, and you only have 140 characters to do this, by the way, on Twitter. Please join us in ending FGM within a generation. Thank you.